All right, our presenter today is Liz Berkland. Liz is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist at the Diabetes and Nutrition Education Center at Mary Greeley. She enjoys running, cooking, and playing with her two boys. Please welcome Liz. All right, thanks, Vicki. Um, yeah, so today we're going to dive into Real Foods for Heart Health. It is um, Heart Health Month as February, so it's kind of a fun topic to cover this time of year. Okay, so I, I did want to do just a quick review of what the American Heart Association recommends for a heart-healthy diet. Um, they do enc encourage a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. I'm going to emphasize that variety piece um, throughout this presentation. They encourage mostly whole grains when we're thinking of our grain sources, um, healthy sources of protein, including legumes, nuts, fish, seafood, um, dairy, lean meat, and poultry, liquid non-tropical vegetable oils. So that's most of our oils um, outside of like coconut oil um, would be a tropical one. So uh, not that one, but the rest of them would be included. And then um, minimizing processed foods or using less processed foods and minimizing the intake of added sugars. That's a newer recommendation um, in the last few years, and we'll go through that. And then foods prepared with little to no salt and then limiting or um, having no alcohol included. So why do we want to get our whole grains. Um, I usually recommend trying to incorporate at least half of your grains as whole grains. Uh, that means you can include some of the white bread or the white pasta, that kind of stuff, but trying to get in more of those as whole grains. Um, why? The list across the top gets into some of the nutrition piece. So the fiber, the B vitamins we get from that, our trace minerals and our antioxidants. Those uh, nutritional pieces are what's really helping to reduce cholesterol levels um, when we're looking at blood work. Uh, it also helps to reduce blood sugar spikes, which in effect reduces inflammation if we can keep our blood sugar a little more stable throughout the day. And it helps with blood pressure um, when we have that fiber, those minerals, antioxidants, that kind of stuff. Um, it also can help with regular bowel movements, which is just... Uh, helpful throughout the day for everyone. So um, getting in those whole grains has that fiber piece. How do you use whole grains? I get this question a lot. What are whole grains? How do I use them? Um, how can I just put them into my normal meals without changing everything up? Uh, one of my favorite ways to do this is to introduce them slowly. And you can do that by doing half white and half wheat. So with things like uh, pasta, you could either jump right into using whole wheat pasta, or if you're a little iffy on the texture change, use um, start off with half white pasta and half wheat pasta, cook them together, and then put them into your dish. Um, for things like white rice that you may have as a side um, more often, can you use a quinoa brown rice blend as a side instead, or even um, doing the thing we did with pasta, mixing brown rice and white rice together so you still have some of that sticky texture, but also some of those whole grains included. Um, with our breads, that would be using either 100% whole wheat bread or like a sprouted grain bread or a whole grain bread that has some fiber in it. If, again, you're not sure about switching your bread over, you can try um, another kind of bread, which is called white wheat. It's still a whole grain, but it's just a little bit of a softer texture, so it's kind of a nice middle ground for a bread option if you typically use white bread. With baked goods, you can trade out half of that white or all-purpose flour for some wheat flour and still make your baked good, as the rest of the recipe would call for. And then in soups or um, casseroles and that kind of thing, you can easily add in some barley or a different grain called farro, which you can find at most grocery stores. You just have to look. Um, but those can be easily added into soups or casseroles and that. that. And it just adds kind of a, a nutty texture. Um, so it is different, but it's also pretty good. So you might really enjoy some of those. And then another easy way to use whole grains would be to have oatmeal for breakfast on some days. 
why should we include more plants? So I kind of lumped in the vegetables, fruits, legumes, or beans, and nuts as uh, what I would consider plants. Whole grains are also plants, but I like to t hit on those separately. Um, plants also have the benefits of fiber, essential vitamins and minerals. Um, those things, again, help to lower cholesterol, help to lower blood pressure, and can reduce those blood sugar spikes that we get when we're eating foods that are low in fiber. And less blood sugar spikes usually means less inflammation in the body. Plants are also really great for gut health, and gut health has been become a more popular topic. I know we've had some prime time talks uh, specifically on gut health, but when we think of vegetables, fruits, uh, beans, and nuts, those are what we call prebiotics, and prebiotics are foods that help to feed that healthy bacteria in our gut. So it just helps, again, with regular bowel movements, um, with hormone signaling and, and inflammation and that kind of stuff that our gut health does impact. How can you include more plants? Um, one big thing I, I encourage with most of my clients is to include a vegetable with your lunch and supper every day, if not most days. Um, trying to get in a serving of vegetables with lunch and supper most of the time is a, is a great way to start or to just um, round out meals. For fruits, I usually encourage people to add those to your breakfast or your snacks if you're not already having them with like lunch and supper. So fruit tends to go well with breakfast. You might have like a piece of uh, whole wheat toast with peanut butter and then put some banana or some berries on top. Or you could add some berries into your oatmeal in the morning. Um, for snacks, you might have a yogurt with some berries in it or dip some apple slices in your yogurt or with um, peanut butter. But that's just a great way to fit those into snacks. Have a variety. I can't stress this enough. Um, with fruits and vegetables, people a lot of times do get kind of stuck in the same uh, routine with those a lot, and then they get tired of it, and they, they just don't crave them anymore. They aren't looking forward to having vegetables with meals, especially when I'm encouraging them to have a serving with lunch and supper every day. So try variety uh, for a few reasons. One, taste buds change over time. So those boiled Brussels sprouts you may be hot as a kid will taste a lot different to you uh, now as an adult when um, maybe they're not boiled anymore. Maybe you have them roasted. Um, so changing the cooking method can also help with that, along with just the fact that our taste buds change as we get older. Kids tend to pick up more on bitter tones, so there's a reason a lot of kids don't love their vegetables when they're little, but if we continue to eat them into adulthood, we lose some of that um, bitter bitterness in our taste buds, so we do tend to like them more um, as we get older. Um, seasons also affect change, so that's another reason to incorporate variety. For example, grapefruit is really yummy right now. Um, it's big, it's juicy, has a lot of flavor, whereas if you picked up a grapefruit in the summer, it might be um, smaller, less juicy, um, more bitter, um, not so sweet. So just kind of keeping an eye on what is in season and moving your go-to fruits and veggies to fit with what's in season. Um, we're in Iowa, so a lot of us realize that like tomatoes are so much better when they're fresh out of the garden or from the farmer's market than um, when it's like mid-winter and we're picking them up at the grocery store. It's just, it's such a, a taste change when we are looking at the seasons um, and what's, what's good right now. It also just helps to keep it interesting so you don't get bored with those meals throughout the day. Um, I'm going to go through some different recipes that incorporates um, plant-based foods into your meals so that it's not like you're completely changing what you're eating, but it's just a, a different um, way to think about it and you know puts in variety. Cooking methods, there are so many ways to cook our foods anymore, um, whether you have an instant pot or an air fryer along with our tried and true, you know, just roasting, grilling, sauteing, um, steaming. There are just a lot of different ways that we can um, cook our foods now, and vegetables are another way to start experimenting with different cooking methods. When we do things like roasting or sauteing or even air frying, when we use those dry cooking methods, we usually um, 
tend to bring out more of that natural sweetness in our vegetables. So it just, it really changes the flavor. And then sometimes that crunch versus a more of a soft texture, people tend to like um, the crunch when we're doing a more of a dry cooking method. So, um, you know, trying, trying out different ways to prepare things. Um, having convenient options too is great. So, you know, using things like your frozen steamer bags of vegetables, the pre-mixed salad bags, the no-sodium-added canned uh, beans, all of those, um, even though they may be processed a bit, they're still really great options and really convenient on nights that we just don't feel like cooking. Or like with frozen vegetables, if you're just cooking for one or two, maybe you only pull out a cup or two at a time to put into a bowl to steam in the microwave versus like doing the whole bag. Um, or being stuck with a lot more than what you can handle for um, one meal. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to get into incorporating the veggies, beans, or lentils into meals. Um, but again, just putting those into pastas, casseroles, sandwiches, um, soups, all of those types of things. Um, and then having nuts in addition, as an addition to your snacks or your breakfast, is a great way to fit those in. So this is the slide that Vicki was talking about. It's broken up into two different slides on your handouts. Um, and I have the link at the bottom where you can find all of these recipes. It's also on one of the last slides in the presentation. But I just wanted to pull a few things from this website, Spin Smart, Eat Smart. It's an Iowa State Extension website, and it's one of my favorite references because they take a lot of what a lot of people would consider kind of normal meals and they just put a few more um, nutritious ingredients in. So for example, on the chicken alfredo pasta, they're using a whole wheat pasta. They're including um, those veggies in there. There's a protein, there's a carb, there's some uh, fat. So it's just making a good, well-rounded meal. Um, and then they're also looking at that cost per serving. Um, so it just kind of highlights both the um, financial and the health aspects um, there. All the same with the vegetable frittata. So I also like this website because it's using a lot of ingredients that you, sh you are probably familiar with or that you can easily find in the grocery store. So like this veggie frittata, this is something that I like to do when I have um, some extra like leftover vegetables at home or I know that I have a good variety of veggies um, or even you can do some frozen, like the mix of frozen um, peppers and onions and that kind of stuff. But basically any veggie, you chop up, saute it, throw your eggs on top um, when you're like frying eggs or anything like that. And then once it's done, put a little cheese on the top. And it's just a great way, again, to get that protein, carb, and fat mixed all together. And they even you know pair it with that wheat toast and some fruit. So that's the other nice thing. If you're looking on this site and you're making a recipe, take a look at what the picture for the presentation looks like, and that'll give you an idea of how to pair it with other um, with the main dish that you're creating. All right, so let's dive in a little more on healthy fats. Uh, some of the older recommendations were to have a low-fat diet. That's no longer the case um, with, with how we address fats and heart health anymore. What we really want to do is focus more on healthy fats. So that would be our vegetable oils. So olive oil, canola oil, using avocado, nuts, seeds, those are all um, what we consider unsaturated fats. So when we're cooking, roasting, or sauteing, I usually encourage people to use something like an olive oil uh, for those cooking methods. However, if you still like butter, we don't have to completely get away from all saturated fats. I usually tell people, try to cook more with those unsaturated, like your oils, and then top your toast or your baked potato or that sort of thing with some butter if you like the real... Um, 100% butter, that's okay to do uh, some of that as well. I also usually encourage people to do some like ground flax seed, um, sesame seeds, sunflower seeds. Those are great to mix in again with snacks or on top of things. So like your salads, your oatmeals. Um, ground flax seed has a lot of that healthy fat that we're aiming for, um, similar to like salmon, trout, tuna. Um, it has a lot of those same qualities, 
but it's pretty mild in flavor. And if you're just adding a spoonful of ground flaxseed to your oatmeal or you're sprinkling some in with your casserole that you're making, it's an easy way to sneak in that healthy fat without having to um, do like, if you're not a big fish person, like (laughs) it's kind of trading that out. Um, The ground flaxseed for the fish is okay. Although, you know, if you like fish, then you can just stick with fish. Um, Minimizing added sugars. Like I said, this is one of the newer recommendations, and it's something that people don't always think about when they're thinking heart health. Um, But it can really help to, again, reduce those blood sugar spikes and so then reduce inflammation. And inflammation is big with heart health. If we can reduce inflammation, that's really makes things easier for the heart to, to pump throughout, you know, blood throughout the body. So, um, with added sugars, it's kind of a tough one because added sugars are not necessarily spelled out on food labels. So we just have to kind of use some critical thinking with, uh, how do we do this recommendation? A big one is just to cut back on regular soda and juice, Um, you can try other options like having some sparkling water with a splash of juice in it might be a a good alternative. Or um, this time of year, it's so cold outside. Try some herbal hot teas. I really like the um, cinnamon spice teas. It's kind of a nice sweet tea that doesn't have artificial sweeteners or um, other sweeteners added in. So trying some some different drink options. Um, some people like to squeeze like some fresh lime juice into water or that sort of thing um, works well too. The second tip here is to use less sugar in our baked goods. So if your um, banana bread calls for a whole cup of sugar, you might be able to get away with three-fourths cup of sugar and so we're still, you know, having basically the same thing. We're just cutting back a little bit on that added sugar. And then the third thing I recommend is just to slow down and truly enjoy your sweets when you're having them. Um, I, I do encourage people to still have some of those favorite things, whether it's um, sweets or, or whatever it is you're looking for. But when we're having them, just slow down and enjoy it. Try to not feel guilty or shame or anything like that because you're having it, just really, um, you know, savor it and, and that sort of thing. Um, notice, notice what you enjoy about the texture and um, the flavors while you are having them. With proteins, uh, American Heart is encouraging people to include some plant-based proteins. Doesn't mean we have to not eat meat. Um, it just means can we get in some more of those plant-based things like the seeds, the beans, um, you know, those those types of proteins. Some ways that I encourage people to do this is, one, you can try out Meatless Monday. See if this idea sounds good to you. Basically, it doesn't have to be Monday, but pick a day of the week where you do try a new, like, vegetarian recipe or you try to just not include meat on that day or even if it's just one meal a week to, to get used to what, um, you know, different meals taste like without meat. Um, if you're not ready for that or if you're just looking for other options, I also like to encourage people to add in beans to foods that they're already eating. So like taco meat, you can easily rinse a can of black beans off and just stir that into your taco meat for taco night. Um, you can also try other recipes like dal, which uses lentils, hummus you might be familiar with, that's chickpeas, refried beans have pinto beans. You know, you can make those either a side dish or part of your main dish. Um, and kind of just decrease a bit on how much of our animal proteins that we're including with those meals. Using nut butters, um, like I said, peanut butter toast in the morning is an easy way to do that. Um, We can also get protein from our dairy, so like yogurt or milk will have some protein in there too. And then they do recommend trying to get in those fatty fish twice a week, so things like salmon, trout, tuna, Again, try them cooked different ways. Um, Steamed salmon tastes very different than like a pan seared salmon. Uh, So just trying trying those out. There's, you know, have you tried tuna steaks versus canned tuna? Just a lot of different ways to incorporate those that we don't always just naturally think about. So um, Googling some of those recipes can be good. And if you're really not a a fish person using that ground flaxseed, and just mixing that into different meals, you know, a spoonful into some different meals, smoothies, oatmeal, yogurt, that kind of stuff can um, be an easy addition as well. 
cookieandkate.com. Again, I have it on my list of references at the end of this presentation, but they are just a great plant-based um, recipe blog. Uh, it's one of my favorite go-tos for recipes. I have not made a recipe I haven't enjoyed from that website, so that's a good one to check out if you are considering the idea of meatless Mondays or you're just wanting to incorporate more plant-based dishes into your week. Salt. This is a big one for heart health. You know, any reduction in our sodium or our salt intake can show improvements in blood pressure. There have been some studies that even if we're not meeting, you know, some of the stricter guidelines, if you're cutting back on your salt throughout the day, it is going to help. Um, when we cut back on our salt, though, it is best to try and replace that with some other flavors. Uh, so it doesn't mean your food needs to be bland. Hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, you are not eating bland food all the time. Um, you still want to enjoy it. Uh, that's what really makes it more sustainable um, and enjoyable uh, when we're making changes. So if you like spicy foods, easy way to cut back on salt and add a punch of flavor, red pepper flakes or some a little pinch of cayenne pepper to your meals um, can, can add a lot of flavor still have that zip with your meals, but um, it's not going to impact blood pressure so much. If you're not into spicy foods, there are other blends that you can try. Mrs. Dash is a pretty well-known brand. You can find it at a lot of grocery stores that is sodium-free and they're low in potassium as well, um, but they have a ton of blends. So you can, I have an example on the screen, but if you Google Mrs. Dash, you'll see all, they probably have 10 different flavors, if not more. So, um, you know, getting a couple of those to try with different things. I had a patient tell me recently about Kingsford sodium-free um, seasoning that is also not high in potassium. So that's a, another good option. Um, or of course, you can make your own do-it-yourself spice blends. Uh, on the next slide, I've got a great handout that um, will help help with figuring that piece out. Or you can just Google, you know, sodium-free taco seasoning blend and make your own um, that way. Uh, when you are looking for a sodium-free seasoning, try to avoid the ones that are really high in potassium. It's okay if there's some potassium, but if it's really high in potassium, just like sodium, we don't want a ton of either one. They can both um, be kind of tough on the body. So trying to just find, like Mrs. Dash is usually a little bit lower, um, avoid the things like, like new salt tends to be pretty high in, in potassium uh, there. And then just getting familiar with new spices and how to cook with them. Um, you know, fresh uh, herbs taste a lot different from dried herbs. And so kind of getting used to which kind are you buying and how are you going to use it. Um, getting used to which ones pair well together. On the next slide, I'm going to hit that. And then cooking with onion and garlic adds a ton of flavor uh, and, and doesn't always require as much salt. Um, also, lemon, lime, or orange zest, or even the juice from any of those can be a good seasoning um, tactic as well. That lemon and lime, again, kind of hits that same zip that uh, salt would um, have. So this is the Cook Smarts Guide to Flavoring with Spices. I did not create this. It's from Cook Smarts, but um, I just love this handout. I had this taped to the inside of my spice cabinet for a really long time just to get used to how um, different flavors go well together. So to use this handout, you can see, let me see if I can get the mouse over. Here we go. Um, so I'm going to take basil, for example. So you'll look for the spice that you want to use. Just check, a, check out what's in your cabinet. You might be surprised at what you've got. Um, so let's say you have some basil and you want to use that up. Let's look down. So it's going to show us what produce goes well with basil, what proteins are going to pair well, what types of foods are going to taste good with basil in it, and then um, other spices that they'll pair well with. So with basil, let's say in your refrigerator you happen to have some zucchini and you also happen to have some chicken. We're going to we're going to stir fry those together in some olive oil. And so we're going to use your dry basil. And maybe we also have some garlic powder and some rosemary. So you can kind of add those two in with the basil, your chicken and your zucchini. And now you've got kind of the start to a meal. Maybe you're going to pair that with some brown rice quinoa blend that you've got 
that you want to try to. So um, that's that's one way to just start checking out the spices. I, I get a lot of people who have spices and they're like, oh, I don't want to buy them because then I use it for one recipe and it just sits there. Um, so open up those doors, check out what you've got. Um, you know, a lot of people might have cumin for, for different dishes. Um, you know, pair that with your garlic and your ginger or whatever, you know, you can just kind of get used to, um, how to use those. If you don't already have blends, if you already have blends, then you can disregard this chart and you may not want to use all single ones, but if you're just trying to get used to using the single ones, this is a great way to get started. Uh, minimizing highly processed food. Again, slow down, taste the foods, notice if you like them, if you don't like them, what you like about them. Um, that can just help us to kind of cut back on some of those uh, highly processed things. And then Again, you don't have to completely get rid of those processed snacks or, or foods in your day, but can we start to trade out a, some of them throughout the week for something like a piece of fruit or a yogurt or um, nuts, you know, some of those whole foods instead? Having, when we're thinking of replacing a snack, usually a good filling snack would be something with some protein or some healthy fat plus a carbohydrate. Um, as a combination. So like apple and peanut butter, grapes and cheese, nuts and pretzels, avocado toast, those are all um, going to be much more filling snacks if you are looking, you know, if you're always super hungry at three o'clock in the afternoon, that might be a good option. And then I encourage people to take advantage of some of those processed things. So um, they can all, a lot of times save us a lot of time um, and a lot of effort. So using like frozen or pre-cut vegetables, technically those are processed a bit, but they're going to be great um, alternatives to not including a vegetable. And, and usually they're just, uh, have just as many health benefits. Um, using those no sodium added canned beans or no sodium added green beans, you know, those kinds of things are going to be great because that sodium's not there, but it is um, already cut and ready to go for you. And then things like different cuts of meat. So um, I like those chicken tender cuts. You know, it's still just raw chicken, but it's just in those nice little portions already. You don't have to go through and cut it up. Um, so that, those are some ways to minimize that. Um, as you're getting started, these are some of those websites that I mentioned throughout the presentation, cookieandcake.com being that plant-based um, website, great recipes there. Um, I'd say that's for people who enjoy cooking a little bit more, although there are some easy recipes in there too. Spend Smart, Eat Smart is the Iowa State Extension website that just takes pretty, you know, normal, typical meals you're probably already familiar with and puts some healthier ingredients in. And then, of course, heart.org is the American Heart Association, um, their website. All right. Any questions? We will look here and see if we have any questions. Uh, where are we? Tim, can you help me out here? Sorry, I did minimize his. Oh. Oh. He, there he got it all right um okay here we have a question if you want to read the question yeah. first and you can take it yeah. all right so the question is what about avocado butter or plant-based butters instead of dairy butter or margarine um some of those can be good options especially if you don't tolerate dairy um very well uh, you can use those uh, off the top of my head, I don't have a specific brand recommendation on those, but in general, I would kind of look for some of the ones that have familiar ingredients to you. So like avocado butter might be a good option. Um, I do also in talk to a lot of people about the butter olive oil blends. So it's, um, I know, I think it's Land Lakes makes it, but oh, there are a lot of just generic brands that make it as well. And it's half regular butter and half olive oil. So that's another good option. I like it because it's easier to spread too. So that's nice. Any other questions come up? I don't see any other questions right now. All right. 
Well, you are welcome to still put some questions out there. I will um, close out our program. And um, I'm going to move my mask down so maybe you can understand me a little better. Thank you, Liz. Great program. Oh, my goodness. I was up there already looking on that Iowa State website. have a couple recipes I want to try. And they do a great job of laying out the nutritional value and the cost per serving. And so um, I'm excited to see the other one. So thank you so much for taking your time to put this together and share it with us today. Um, this month, we still have one more program. Um, it is Thursday, February 17th, again at 2 p.m., um, virtual program, and it is Making Exercise Stick, and that is um, Carrie Adams, who is the supervisor of our Cardiac Rehab Center, and so she'll talk about the recommendations for exercise and how to get started, and then most importantly, how to make it stick, because that's the most important part. So um, once again, thank you, Liz. I do not see any questions. You did a great, you must have answered everything. So thank you for joining us, everyone. Have a great day and stay warm.